Prior to the 1970s, if you had a computational problem you needed to solve that seemed to be hard, but for which you knew there was an algorithm, so it wasn't uncomputable, you more or less just threw your hands up and said, this is a hard problem, I don't know how to do any better than this. But in the 1970s uh, came a revolution in ideas that allowed you to do much better. The key idea here is the notion of a brute force search algorithm. So P is the class of problems for which a solution can be found efficiently. And NP is the class of problems for which a solution can be found by brute force. And this was often how you knew that a problem was computable because you could write a brute force algorithm for it. And in the context of algorithms, of course, we don't mean this kind of brute force. Brute force looks much more like this. In the 1960s and before in Russia, they tried to formalize the notion of brute force, which they referred to as parabor. And it turns out to actually be quite tricky to formalize this notion. The formalization that was settled on in the 1970s, both in Russia and in the US, and is now the accepted standard, is that NP is the class of problems for which you can check a solution efficiently. And the analogy here is to a needle in a haystack. If I show you a piece of hay or a needle, it's very easy for you to check, is this a piece of hay or is this a needle? And therefore, there is a brute force algorithm for finding a needle in a haystack, namely, go through each item in the haystack and check, is this a needle? So the P versus NP problem is essentially the question of, can brute force search algorithms always be improved? And it turns out that this is perhaps the most important open question in all of computer science and mathematics. But before getting to that, let's dig more into the details of this. I said P is the class of problems whose solution can be found quickly. And the asterisk here is because the formal definition is solution can be found in an amount of time that is, scales polynomially with the size of the input. We've already seen some problems in P, and I'll mention those in just a few more. Sorting lists of integers, solving systems of linear equations, deciding whether a network is connected, multiplying integers, max flow min cut on a network, uh, finding the minimum spanning tree of a network, and there are hundreds of other problems for which there are polynomial time algorithms. Another aspect of this star is that polynomial time doesn't always mean that you can find the solution efficiently in practice. An algorithm that takes n to the 10,000 steps on inputs of size n is hardly efficient in practice. But it turns out, historically, the major obstacle for a problem is showing that it can be solved in polynomial time. And once that's done, people are then often able to improve the algorithms to the point where they actually are efficient in practice. So although this formal notion a priori doesn't necessarily correspond to the notion of being efficient in practice, in practice, it does. So this has been a very fruitful definition in computer science. NP is the class of problems whose solution can be verified quickly. And again, this asterisk here means the same thing. The solutions can be verified in polynomial time. An example of such a problem is the problem of factoring integers in which you're given an integer n and you want to find a factorization of n into two smaller integers p and q where n is p times q. This is in np because if I give you p and q it's very easy to verify that their product is n. However, finding p and q given n is a notoriously difficult problem. My favorite example of a problem in np is kidney donor matching, because this is a problem where if you make theoretical progress on this computational problem, you can literally help save lives. In this problem, the issue is that people who need a kidney often aren't a match with their close relatives who would be the most likely candidates to donate a kidney. So instead what happens is there's a database of people who need kidneys and people who can donate kidneys. And frequently what will happen is that say I will need a kidney and my spouse is willing to donate a kidney but we are not a match. So we enter in the database together saying my spouse is willing to donate a kidney if someone else is willing to donate me a kidney. So I'll denote this uh, dots here in our database will be people and an arrow from A to B will mean that person A can donate a kidney to person B. 
Here we see a database with two pairs in it who have entered the database together where this person is willing to donate a kidney and this person needs one. And similarly, this person is willing to donate a kidney and this person needs one. And these arrows indicate that we can do a kidney swap here. This person can donate to this person. This person can donate to this person. Everyone who needs a kidney gets it. The computational problem here is I give you a database which maybe has thousands of people in it, some of whom are in couples, some of whom are not. And you ask, is there a set of swaps that I can do that will save at least a thousand lives? Why is this problem in NP? Well, if I show you the thousand swaps, it's very easy for you to check were these valid swaps? Did in fact a thousand different people receive kidneys? Did no one receive more than one kidney? Did no one donate more than one kidney? Those are very easy to check. So this problem is in NP. We can also use this problem to start to see why problems in NP are difficult. So imagine instead of our database looking like this, it looked like this. Right? There's nothing to prevent us from doing a three-way swap. So if you look at this set of three couples, you'll see this person can donate to this person, this person can donate to this person, and this person can donate to this person. And then among these three couples, everyone who needed a kidney got one. Why does this start to make the problem difficult? Well, if we had an algorithm that at some point came upon this set of pairs and decided, oh, I can swap kidneys here, so the algorithm says, let's do that. Well, by having used up this pair in this swap, you've precluded yourself from doing this three-way swap and you've actually saved fewer lives. And you can imagine if your database had thousands of people in it, that these kind of implications can cascade. So if you do this swap, that prevents you from doing this three-way swap, which maybe allows you to do some other four-way swap, but then maybe that prevents you from doing a 10-way swap and so on. The largest actual swap that I am aware of was a 60-person swap reported in the New York Times, starting from a good Samaritan and leading to a chain of 60 kidneys that got swapped simultaneously. Now I want to come back to why is P versus NP so important? It turns out the thousands of problems that people really want to solve are all in NP. And the way I phrase this, this shouldn't be so surprising because what this really says is that thousands of people problems that people really want to solve can all be solved by brute force. The interesting fact discovered in the 1970s is that in fact, all of these thousands of problems are computationally equivalent to kidney donor matching. That is, they're not just in NP, they're what's called NP complete, which means if you make significant progress on finding better algorithms for any one of them, that actually leads to significant progress on all of them. Here is just a small sampling of the problems that people actually want to solve. Some of them you can tell are of dire importance. Some of them are frivolous fun. Uh, it's easy to Google and find lists of thousands of, of problems of both types that are all NP complete. So now we've turned this cartoon from throwing up your hands and saying, I guess this is just a hard problem to being able to say this problem is actually NP complete. So not only can I not solve it, but neither can all of the thousands of other people who have worked not only on this problem, but on any NP complete problem, including many famous mathematicians and computer scientists. It turns out that P versus NP is not only important in computer science, it's also important in mathematics. This was realized as early as 1956, almost 20 years before P and NP were defined in a letter from Kurt Gödel to John von Neumann, where in today's language, Gödel essentially said, if P is equal to NP, then one can quickly check if any math statement has a proof shorter than say a billion characters. And if it does, you can use this procedure to find the proof. And if not, then you basically say, well, I as a human am never going to find a proof longer than a billion characters, so I should basically give up on this problem. It also turns out in the last 15 years or so, people have realized that the P versus NP question itself is related to deep, centrally old problems in mathematics, not just about proofs themselves, but about geometry and algebra. In the year 2000, the Clay Mathematical Institute announced its seven millennium prize problems for which a solution would earn the solver a million US dollars. One of these was solved in 2003. One of these is the famous Riemann hypothesis, and one of these problems is P versus NP. And because of this initial observation of Gödel and von Neumann, 
it turns out that if p were equal to np, you could then in fact solve all seven of these problems by simply asking an algorithm whether they were true or not. So p versus np, the question of whether brute force search can always be improved, which seems just like a question about algorithms, turns out to be a fundamentally important problem throughout computer science and mathematics.